Well, good, good morning, everybody. How are we this morning? Good morning. Whether you're online or, or joining us in person, thank you so much for joining us this morning. I'm going to start with a passage of Scripture that is extremely relevant to what we're talking about today, uh, and it is in Matthew 5. It says this, You, talking to the church, are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall, it be, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand it gives light to all the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for another opportunity to worship you. God, whether it's our first time worshiping you or our millionth time worshiping you, God, I ask that this would be a new experience. God, that you would teach us something new about who you are, that you would show us where you want us to go next in our walk with you, and God, that uh, we would just leave this place feeling closer to you, not because of the music, not because of the message, but, but God, because of who you are and where you've called us to. God, we love you. We lift this time of worship to you, and it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Let's stand. Let's stand now as we sing together. Brother Tim wanted to borrow my walker this morning. I told him, no, I need it today. So we do pray for his recovery, continued recovery. It's going well, and we just hope it keeps going. This is written by a famous composer called somebody named Ludwig van Beethoven. Joyful, joyful, we adore this from his ninth symphony.
thank you. Be seated now. The choir is going to sing. We believe. <coughs> other at this time as brother Tim makes his way up here he asked for extra time so let's all stand and say a word of greeting to everyone that's here
seats. Um, this was, I grew up. <laughs> I grew up at First Baptist Church Barstow, and I can tell you as a kid, turning to greet everyone standing around you was always my favorite part, because that's when I got to go find my friends, um, and I never liked it when they were like, let's go back to our seats. So I understand, but let's go back to our seats. However, if you've never met me before, uh, my name is Tim. I'm the student pastor here, as well as the, the worship pastor for the contemporary service. So because I'm this, the youth pastor, I have to, we have to play a game. Is that okay? Can we play? You don't have to move far, all right? We're just going to do a couple of backflips. I'm just kidding. So if you guys can stand and you need, to, you need to have a partner, all right? Ed's looking at me like, what are you doing? Okay, Ed, you can't steal this for the, for the Spanish service, okay? No, but let's all stand, okay? Have you all ever played rock? And you can play this at home too. If you're watching live, feel free to play this at home. Uh, have you ever played rock, paper, scissors? Okay, you never play one round, right? You always play best two out of three, right? So that's what we're going to do. But just a little bit to make it fun, okay, this is called bear man gun, okay? Instead of rock, paper, scissors, we have bear man gun, all right? So uh, the man beats the gun, the gun beats the bear, the bear beats the man. If you tie, you lose, Okay. All right, so if you want to do, this is where it gets fun. Are we ready? You got to get outside your comfort zone. If you want to do the bear, you don't just do something with your hands. You have to be a bear, okay? Okay, if you want to be the, the we'll just say the squirt gun. Is that fair? If you want to be the squirt gun, you got you to do the squirt gun, okay? And if you want to be the man, you have to strike a pose, okay? So let me go through it again. The man beats the gun. The gun beats the bear. The bear beats the man. If you tie, you lose, okay? So I'm going to count one, two, three, and you're going to show each other whatever it is, okay? And if you lose, you have to buy lunch, okay? So there's some steaks, all right? And if you, hey, and you could actually have steaks. Are we ready? Here we go. Bear, man, gun. Are we ready? Here we go. One, one, two, three. Oh, I see some ties. If you tie, you both lose, okay? Best two out of three. Here we go. Here's number two. We might see some winners here. Here we go. One, two, three. Ah, I love, I never told you to growl, and yet you're still growling. I love it. So great. Okay, last round. We're, this, is where, this is where stakes are high. Literally, if you order steak for lunch, it could be very high. Here we go. Ready? One, two, three. Ooh. I like. There we go. Awesome. Give yourselves a hand. Okay. Awesome. I got to have some fun if I'm the youth pastor. You can have a seat. Uh, so if you lost, I'm so sorry. But uh, how about if you lose, you get to pick the restaurant. So maybe pick your house and that's the cheapest option for you. Okay. Um, so anyways, uh, my name is Tim. I'm so glad. I'm obviously, I'm glad to be here. I'm obviously not Pastor Rich. He's currently flying in a plane um, right now to Nashville. And so he asked me if I would like to, to preach this Sunday. So I'm so excited to be with you guys as we continue our series uh, through 1 Corinthians 13. However, as you can see, because of camp, I'm a little, a little injured. So I'm going to give you some historical context, okay? Uh, and pa Pastor Ed, he's preaching during the, during the Spanish service, so feel free to steal this, okay? Uh, in, in ancient uh, Israel, and actually still practiced to this day, the rabbi or the teacher would sit, and everybody that was learning would stand. So we're going to do that. So I'm going to sit, okay? Uh, and all of you stand I'm just kidding. You can stay. You can stay seated. You all looked at me like, I'll play your game, but I'm not standing for your sermon. Okay. All right. Uh, so if you have your Bibles, uh, go ahead and turn to 1 Corinthians 13 for me. All right. And we have, we have a video while you are turning there. Okay. So while you're turning to 1 Corinthians 13, watch this. Hello, everyone. Here are the three giving options for the First Baptist Church of Asperia. You can go to our website at fbch.org and choose Give at the right side of the menu. On the Give page, enter the amount you wish to give and choose if it is a one-time or a recurring give and press Next. You will then be asked to enter and confirm a phone number to continue to the payment page. You can also text FPC Hesperia to 77977 to receive a link to the same payment page.
Another option is by cash or check. Please mail checks to 9280 Maple Avenue, Hesperia, California 92345. Thank you for your giving faithfulness. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to call the church. Hi, I'm Jason. This is my wife Amanda, and we're with Skate Riot, and these are your morning announcements. Saturday, August 13th, we would like to remind you that that's the men's breakfast starting at 8.30 a.m. Suggested donation is $3. Just show up with your money. Uh, join us on August 14th at 5.30 p.m. here at FBCH for Praise and Paint Night. Uh, the cost is $30. You can sign up at the Welcome Center, and the deadline to do that is August 7th. Are you new here? Fill out this card. Join into the Welcome Center for a free gift, and we'd like to get a hold of you, see what we could do to help you enjoy and uh, get connected with our church. Are you interested in serving? Here's the card. Fill it out and uh, we can figure out how to get you plugged into any of the ministries out here and there's no need to worry, we will train you for anything we need. Again, thank you for coming and enjoy your weekend. Have a wonderful day. Bye. Yesterday we had our REAL meeting, which if you're not aware, REAL stands for Recruit and Equip Authentic Leaders. Uh, and I got to sit at a table with a couple of my youth leaders, Ron, uh, Joel and then uh, Pastor Ed, we got to sit at a table and just pray about what's happening in the church, what's happening in our personal lives, uh, and for example, Koinonia Night, if you got to be here for that, that was such a special time of worship that was so much fun, uh, but then there's just so many great things. We got to hear from the Peru team, uh, over a hundred salvations that they got to see happen in Peru. Uh, we got to see a brand new uh, sal one salvation, uh, 16 rededications, 10 uh, calls to service in this church and two calls to full-time vocational ministry at youth camp. Um, we got to see multiple kids at, at camp and then also the following Sunday come to know Christ. So there is a lot of amazing things happening and if you think that this world is getting darker, let me just say this, if there's one light left, darkness cannot win. And so as we add lights to this world, how amazing is that, amen? So there's so many great things that are happening in this church and, and um, all across every service, uh, some great things are happening. So we are in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. We have been going through a series on love. And so just as Pastor Rich and Pastor Carlos have been doing, I want to open us with a time of reading the entire chapter um, of 1 Corinthians 13. So read with me, please. 1 Corinthians 13 says this, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect one comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part. Then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide. These three, but the greatest of these is love. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. God, I thank you that as your word says, it is sharper than any two-edged sword. And God, I thank you that it never goes dull. God, that it can also always cut through the lies that the world will, will try and sell us. God, I thank you that it is living and active. God, that it is your breath, your words, that when we're wondering what you would call us to do or what you would say, God, we can simply open these pages to spend time with you. And I ask that we would do that this morning. I pray that... Uh, this morning, we would not be sitting um, in, a, in a church building, but God, we would be seated at the feet of you as you speak to us this morning. Um, God, I ask, uh, as Pastor Rich prays each week, 
God, that you would increase and I would decrease. God, that I would learn right alongside this congregation as you speak through me. I pray all of this in the name of Jesus that allows us to pray to you boldly and with access. It's his, his name we pray. Amen. All right. Um, so I, I love that passage of scripture. And, and many times this happens. We actually just went through a series with the students called Cliché. And there are so many things, basically if you don't know what a cliche is, that is something that has been used so many times throughout history that it has either lost its original meaning or it has been warped over time. And so with this passage, most of the time the only part that is focused on is starting in verse 4 and ending in verse 8. And it is often read in weddings. But there is so much uh, in this passage of scripture, just chapter 13 itself, um, talking about why we are to love. And, and when we look at the part before verse 4, where it talks about all of these amazing things, if you could do this, and if you could do this, and if you could do this, but you have not love. Now, I don't know about you, but when I was a little kid, I'm pretty sure every little kid would agree with me, you want to be a superhero. Would you agree? You want to be able to fly and have superpowers. And that, to me, sounds like a superhero. When you read that resume... That is a powerful person, and yet, Scripture says, if that person doesn't love, it's worthless. And so this passage of Scripture is so powerful, but I want to give us a little bit of context. How did we get 1 Corinthians? And how did we get 2 Corinthians? Okay, um, So just to start here, I think it's important for the, for the purposes of today's message to understand this. Uh, the Corinthian church, Corinth is a city, and the Corinthian church... More than a lot of churches that we see reflected in Scripture was a confused church. Uh, and actually, it's because of their confusion that we end up with the truths of Scripture. It's amazing how God does that, right? Because of what they were doing wrong, God used that for our benefit today to learn of what he would call us to do. Uh, first and foremost, how did we get this? Uh, church was new, all right? They did not, people didn't have a copy of the Bible just laying around the house. Back then... Letters were written. This is actually a letter written from Paul. Uh, and this is why they wrote to Paul, because they were confused. It was a brand new church. They didn't have a copy of the New Testament. All they had were the Old Testament um, uh, manuscripts, maybe, maybe some copies of that, not even the whole thing. And so they're trying to learn, and it's sometimes the blind leading the blind, which is never good. And so thankfully, what they did was they wrote to Paul. And here's what's even... I think greater and more ironic, the reason why Paul wrote back in such length is because of all the problems that he heard about. Okay, this, was a, this is not a good church, and I think when you get a long text message or a long email, you know that something's wrong. Amen? They've got to talk to you about something. And so with a lot of these letters that we see in the Bible, they're relatively short, However, when we get Corinthians, there's multiple letters that are extremely long, and that tells us there's a lot going on with that church, and we can be thankful for that today because it allows us to have a lot of truths. Uh, to give you an example, starting off right away in what's called the greeting or the salutation of 1 Corinthians, it says this, 1 Corinthians 1, 10 through 13, I appeal to you, this is Paul talking to the church at Corinth in chapter 1, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the, the same judgment. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. What I mean is that each one of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized by the name of Paul? See, this is the problem that Paul is getting at. And it's not good when you get a call from a parent saying, someone told me what you did at school today. That was never a good thing for me, especially because both of my parents were teachers. That was never good. Hey, someone called me today. Like, I never got sent to the office because my dad was the principal. Like, that's how bad my situation was. And so this is the parent saying, someone told me all of the things that you're doing, and what is wrong? What's the biggest problem? What's the crux of all of the things that he's going to reflect in the, in the book of 1 Corinthians, the letter to 1 Corinthians? The biggest problem is that they were not focused on unity. They were not focused on building up the church. And by consequence, they were neglecting unity. 
And what happens when we neglect things? We know very well in the high desert, they, they fall apart. Caitlin's not here right now, so I'm going to tell you guys a story. Is that okay? Gail, you can't tell her, okay? Uh, so Caitlin loves flowers. She loves to garden, all right? However, I tell her whenever she wants, she gets the green thumb and she wants to go looking for, for some things to garden, I tell her, I know that I'm going to end up being the one that waters this stuff. I know it's going to happen. No, I'll do it, I'll do it. We'll make it a chore for Kennedy. And so just recently, she wanted to get hanging boxes uh, with flowers for our house, just to spruce it up, make it look pretty, right? So I said, okay, but I'm not, I don't have time. I'm not going to be the one to water the It's okay, it's okay, it's okay. And so as you know, uh, plants don't do too well on their own in the desert. And so we go buy these hanging baskets for our house, and we hang them up in front of our house. And maybe for about three days, we're doing good, you know? She's watering them, taking Kennedy out there. She has a bucket by the door so she doesn't forget. And then what slowly starts to happen? Plants start to wither. And I'm like, are you going to water those? And I was sticking to my guns this time, right? I was like, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to give in. And uh, lo and behold, she, was, she believed she could bring them back. But they, they, they are long gone because they were neglected in the, in the wilderness of the desert. And actually what's so funny is to this day, they're still sitting on our porch like deader than dead, like they are beyond anyone's help at all, right? When we neglect things, they start to fall apart. There is a great show um, on HBO, or sorry, not HBO, on Discovery, and it is called Homestead Rescue, and it is Caitlin's and my favorite show right now. We watch that so much because these, this family, the Rainey family, they go all over the U.S. and they help people with their homesteads, people that are trying to live off their grid simply. And it's so funny that so many times they get to these places where these cabins have been neglected. And just yesterday we were watching this episode where Matt, one of the sons, walks up to the cabin and grabs one of the logs at the end. And it's so rotted from just sitting there that he literally just pulls and the whole chunk of that log just falls off and disintegrates. This is what happens when we neglect things in the church. If we ignore unity and if we quarrel and divide the church cannot fulfill its mission and unity in a, in a sense consequently is torn down and falls apart that is the biggest problem in the corinthian church and i would venture to say that is still a big problem in the church one that we're still addressing today and i love Koinonia nights. If you've never been to one, please come. It's an amazing time for all three of our services to come together and sing songs together in different languages and to hear what's happening in our whole church. I love that. I've never seen a church focus as hard uh, as we are because this is something that has to be addressed. For thousands of years, it's needed to be addressed, and it's still the case today. Now, let me make a side note here. It's easy to condemn the Corinthian church. Just like when you read the Old Testament, it's easy to condemn Israel. Amen? It's easy to look at them and go, oh, didn't you know? Turn the page. He was going to give you manna. It's right there on the next page. Right? Oh, didn't didn't you read your Bible? Paul talks about you. You should have known that this was going to... Guys, they didn't have the Bible. Okay? And so it's so easy for us to condemn them for not understanding. But you guys, we struggle with the same things. Okay, this is written to the church. Ecclesiastes 1.9. What has been is what will be. And what has been done is what will be done. And there is nothing new under the sun. That's Old Testament. And it still rings true. The problems are just packaged differently. Disconnection is created through different avenues. But it is still alive. And it's still at the crux of so many problems within this church and within all churches. And these won't go away. However, they can be addressed. And so that's what we want to talk about as we go through this series. So if you will look back with me now, we're going to uh, fast forward back to where we started, uh, 1 Corinthians 13, okay? And our focus verse for this morning is verse 6. So if you look at verse 6 with me, I have to turn the page for that. Verse 6 says this, It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but it rejoices with the truth. Ed and I were talking yesterday that at first when Pastor Rich asked us to use uh, this verse, 
it's just very, very short. And we have to feel, you know, I'm expected to be like Rich, so I need to talk to you guys for four hours on six words. I don't, I don't know how I'm going to do that, right? But then as we dug into, don't tell him I said that, as we dug into this, what we found was that there are so many truths. And I was amazed to just have the Holy Spirit teach me as I was writing this sermon uh, for you guys this morning. Because you may be thinking you're good in this area. Doesn't rejoice in wrongdoing? I'm not guilty of that, right? I only rejoice in the good stuff, right? That's, that's what we might be thinking. My notes are broken here. There we go. That's what we might be thinking, okay? However, uh, there are two main ways that all of us struggle with this, okay? Two main ways that all of us struggle with this. The first one is commission, which means we practice it. This is a sin of commission, meaning that we're not supposed to do something and we do it, okay? The other way that we'll talk about here in a little bit is omission. And what that is is we let it happen. We know we're supposed to do something, but we don't. There are two types of sins in the Bible, not just one. A lot of times we focus on sins of commission, things that we're not supposed to do. However, if we are commanded to do something, if my parents tell me to clean my room and I don't, I get in trouble. Not today. That would be weird. But when I was a kid, if I didn't clean my room when I was told to, I would get in trouble. Right? Men, if you don't do the honeydew list, you might get in trouble. Right? These are sins of omission. So we're going to focus on this first group, sins of commission. How do we do this? Okay? Because here's what we think this means. When we hear rejoices in unrighteousness, here's what we think this means. Caitlin and I, right before we moved back to California a couple of years ago, we were doing uh, church planting. We were helping with church planting in Colorado. And if you don't know, Colorado is like a baby California politically, right? And if anything, it's, they're at the same level. And I'll never forget, there was one day we were having lunch downtown in Longmont, Colorado, and we hear a lot of noise happening outside. And so we're wondering what's going on. And so we kind of look out the door. I think we were getting pizza or something like that. And you see this huge parade going down this road. People just walking down the street. It wasn't organized. Right? They were just doing this on their own accord. Hundreds of people walking down the street, singing, playing music, and all of them were wearing the rainbow colors, and it was a pride parade. Celebrating what we know to be wrong in Scripture. That's what we think this means. And while it does, that is why we think we're innocent, because at least we're not doing that, Right? I, can think, I think that we can all agree that that isn't good when we're celebrating something like that. And while we're going to get to the application of how to address this, okay, it's not through hate, by the way, I think we can all agree that that's not good. But even though we don't celebrate out loud when bad things happen around us, my question is this, have you ever been glad when those you don't like, quote unquote, get what they deserve? Maybe you've used those words this morning. Your husband was trying to do something while he was holding his hot coffee. I warned you. Now you got to change your clothes and get some burn cream, right? This whole you're getting what you deserve mentality. Let me share another story with you. I had a bully when I was growing up. If you don't know, I was very small. I wore Harry Potter glasses and I had a bowl cut. I was not intimidating when I was a child, okay? I, we're not going to show you a picture, thankfully. Um, but I was not intimidating, and I had a bully. I'm not going to share his name with you. We'll just call him Greg. Um, but I had a bully when I was growing up, and this bully was dating my best friend. Man, that stinks. That's what Hallmark movies are made of, right? <laughs> my bully was dating my best friend, and I heard that this bully of mine was cheating on my best friend. He was dating and flirting with other girls. And what did I do? I sat back and I waited until he got what he deserved. And I even tried to manipulate the situation so she would find out. And eventually, guess what happened? She did find out. And they worked it out and stayed together. And I was so bitter. I was so mad, right? Justice was not served in my definition. I am not called to define justice, people. Neither are you. You guys, all of us are called 
to respond to evil, not idly sit by and watch it happen. And that's a small story, but you have to remember that this is the opposite of what we are called to be. Micah 6, 8 says this, He, God, has told you, O man and woman, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? Require. Meaning this is a command. What does the Lord require of you? But to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. I remember I grew up uh, First Baptist Church, so singing hymns. I remember still holding the hymnal. This morning was great. And it's amazing to me. There's so many hymns because I, I knew all of them until that second to last one. And I was like, it's amazing that there's still some that I don't know. And I remember this song, and to do justly, and to love mercy, right? This song that we'd sing all the time. That's Micah 6, 8. That word kindness, maybe your Bible translated as mercy, translates it as mercy. Here's what that kindness means. The Hebrew word for, for kindness right there in Micah 6, 8 is hesed. And if you've studied much of scripture before, you've probably heard that word come up. That's probably because it's used 240 times in the Old Testament, it's pretty important in the Hebrew culture. This is what it means. Loving kindness, steadfast love, grace, mercy, faithfulness, goodness, devotion. The consistent, ever faithful, relentless, constantly pursuing, lavish, extravagant, unrestrained, furious love of our Father God. That definition comes from the Vines uh, Expository Dictionary of the Old and New Testaments. That's quite a call. That is what we are required to be. Do you know what mercy is? We've used that word a lot, but do you, have you ever asked what it means? It's not receiving what you do deserve. When we sit by and let evil ap happen to our enemies and say they're getting what they are deserving, we are doing the opposite of what God commands us to be, to show mercy. We are no better than the greatest example I could think of, or God could think of, that he blessed me with, and that's Jonah. If you don't know the story of Jonah, I'm going to tell it to you. You're going to read a whole book of the Bible today. You're welcome. Jonah was a prophet of God. And what's very interesting about the book of Jonah is most of the time in the Old Testament, prophets were called to deliver messages to Israel. He was the mouthpiece of God to the nation of Israel. What's really interesting about Jonah, though, uh, is that Jonah was a prophet of God called to a Gentile nation called Nineveh. A Gentile is a non-Jew. And if you don't know about Nineveh, Nineveh was the big city in a, in a nation called Assyria, one of Israel's worst enemies. And they were brutal people. They worshipped a god that looked like a fish. But on top of that, one of the ways that they would torture people would be to tie each limb to an animal and send those animals in other directions. They would do siege warfare on Israel all the time just to mess with them, where they would encamp themselves around Israel's city and not allow any food in and nobody out until people started to die. They were brutal enemies of Israel. And God says, I want you, Jonah, to go to the, those people. Now, we don't know if there's a direct connection. We don't know if maybe people that were close to Jonah uh, were killed by Assyrians or whatever it may be. Um, but maybe all of us know, did Jonah go to Nineveh at first? No. He went as far as he could in the other direction. And what many people don't know is that Jonah, a lot of scholars believe at this point, was suicidal. Because what we see is it says that he paid the fare, meaning that he would have sold everything he had to pay the cost that, that it would have cost to go as far as he was wanting to go. It was going to be a very expensive journey in the opposite direction. He was willing to give it all up, to go the other way. And then this happens and, and God sends a storm to turn Jonah around. And we think the storm is punishment. It wasn't. It was proof of God's relentless pursuit of all people in this world. And he's sleeping. I don't know about you, but I have woken up to an earthquake before. He would have been woken up, but he was able to just sleep through it. And when they're trying to figure out what's going on, he says, it's me. I know it's me because I know that God. 
throw me overboard. I'm done. He's trying to get us to turn around. I'm done. So he gets thrown overboard. And there's this turning point in that story where Jonah is sinking. And he cries out to God. You can imagine the weight of the water crushing his body. And he cries out to God to save him. And then what does God appoint? A fish. Again, we think the fish is punishment. That's how it was taught to me as a kid. You sit here and think about what you did. It's not. The fish is salvation. What's amazing is as you read the book of Jonah, uh, it's four chapters and there's actually a mirror right in the middle. Everything in the first chapter is down. He went down to the docks. He, went, he was going down to Tarshish. He went down into the bowels of the boat. He was sinking down to the bottom of the sea. The whole first two chapters is down, 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 down. And then the fish comes and brings him up. And he is brought up out of the water and he goes up to Nineveh and he's thrown up by the fish. And there's this reversal and this is the triumphant moment. We think Jonah got it. God says the same thing. He doesn't scold Jonah. He doesn't say, now that was dramatic, wasn't it? Wouldn't it have just been easier? He doesn't say that. What's amazing is the beginning of chapter one and the beginning of chapter three are almost identical. God says the same thing. Rise and go to Nineveh. He doesn't scold him. He says, we have work to do, and I need you to do it. Get up and go to Nineveh. And so he does, finally. He walks to the middle of the city, and he gives a sermon that all of us wish was given every Sunday. It was just a few words telling them to basically repent or you're going to be destroyed. And you think that Jonah got it. And we see a reversal of the people of Nineveh. But then we get to Jonah chapter 4. And we really see the heart of the issue. If you turn with me um, to the book of Jonah, chapter 4. Sorry, my, my Bible is very old and my pages are sticking together. So, Keep flipping past it. There we go. Jonah chapter 4. I'm going to read the whole chapter for us. And I want you to see he delivers the sermon. We see a reversal of the people of Nineveh. And then we see this. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly. And he was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful. There's that word slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said to Jonah, Do you do well to be angry? Jonah went out of the city and sat to the east of the city and made a booth for himself there and sat under it in the shade till he should see what would become of the city. He's waiting for the destruction that he wanted. He's waiting for Nineveh to, quote-unquote, get what they deserve. Now the Lord God appointed a plant and made shade for Jonah, that it might be a shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that, that attacked the plant so that it was withered. When the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. And he asked that he might die and said, it is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, do you do well to be angry for the plant? And he said, yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. And listen to these words. The Lord said to Jonah, you pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in the night. And should not I pity Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also much cattle. And that's how the story ends. We don't know what happens with Jonah. We don't get the, the bow. All we see is God telling Jonah, why would I not care for 120,000 people? Because they're your enemies? Who are you? 
This is kind of like the moment when Job is talking with God and, jo- and God tells Job, make yourself a man. Were you there when the foundations of the earth were created? When we quietly hope for and rejoice in wrong happening to anyone, we are acting as followers of Satan, not followers of Christ. Because Satan has the agenda to steal, kill, and destroy. You know what the rest of that verse says, John 10, 10? Satan comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Christ says this. Instead, we should be like this. We should want all people to have life and have it in abundance. When you hold that grudge and that anger and you let the evil happen so they can learn their lesson... You're taking the place of God and you're being an advocate for what Satan does. Stealing, killing, and destroying. When you neglect it, which we will talk about here soon, it's being destroyed right in front of our eyes. Three areas that this happens are enemies, which is where we just looked, but in our homes. The I told you so. The bickering and arguing. Not talking things out and letting things go. In our church, this was where Paul was hearing of it. Paul is hearing of this in Corinth, in the church. This is a letter written to Corinth. By gossip. Maybe. Maybe as I was growing up in the bless your heart mentality. Well, bless his heart. Maybe you've said that before. Watching things fail instead of helping. This leads to the second way we rejoice in unrighteousness. And that's omission. If commission is doing what we shouldn't, omission is not doing what we should. And we watch it happen. When I was growing up, uh, I have an older brother and an older sister. They're actually going to be here for the 1015 service. So I can't wait to share this story with them sitting in the room. But uh, I was the youngest. I am the youngest. I don't know why I said was. I am the youngest. And I remember, uh, really, I was the middle child, in a sense, because I was always between the two of them. It was an older sister and an older brother, which meant they argued a lot, and I had to choose a side, right? And I, unfortunately, never really chose well um, because I was a small guy. And I will never forget this moment. This happened a few times. I will never forget this moment. Um, Civil War-style battles were happening in my house. And here's what that means. Uh, Sometimes my brother and sister, uh, while my parents were getting their classrooms set up and we were older and they trusted us, I don't know why, to stay at home alone, my brother and sister would get into an argument and it would turn to, to fists and they would only punch each other in the arm. But why, the reason why I say it was like a civil war was because they would take turns. So one would punch, and they would kind of brace for it, and bam, and like, oh. And then they'd wind up, and wham. And where was I? Watching it happen like a tennis match. <laughs> guys, stop. Guys, guys, we really shouldn't do this. Guys, stop. That's what we're doing. We are the unmotivated middle child. This is seeing evil in the world and not caring about it beyond sharing our opinions, void of action. We're so good at sharing opinions. We've gotten mechanized with it, with technology. You know what the Bible says about our opinions? The Bible is full of examples of how God views being apathetic or not caring But let me give you the the biggest example that God brought to my mind. Proverbs 18, 2. A fool takes no pleasure in understanding, but only in expressing his opinions. A fool. If you don't know, there's two main characters in the book of Proverbs, the fool and the wise. Which one do you think we're supposed to be? The wise. And we're going to talk about that later. He says go, but we stay. That's a sin of omission. He says serve, but we want to be served. That's a sin of omission. He says give, but we want to receive. That's a sin of omission. He says, quote, save others by snatching them out of the fire. 
James 1.23, and yet we watch the world burn. You know, what's interesting about that word rejoice uh, in 1 Corinthians 13.6, that word rejoice in the Greek is Cairo. Maybe you've heard that word before. And that's commonly used in scriptural times as a greeting, interestingly enough, in my, in my studies. So let me tell you this. We rejoice in, wrong, in wrongdoing by welcoming it, uh, welcoming it in like we're sitting in our chairs as a murder enters into our homes. That's the danger of omission. And just because we're not the ones celebrating in a parade or partying in a bar as people get drunk or whatever it may be, doesn't mean we are innocent here. The Bible says be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. We might think that we can try and be innocent, but that means we like to play with the line. Because if you just try to be innocent, you're inevitably going to cross that line. But if you are wise and you do the knowledge that you've been given, you will be innocent every time. We are not innocent here. This is where Adam went wrong in Genesis 3. A sin of omission. We like to, guys like to say, girls, you all did it. You, you, you just messed it all up. You're the one that bit the fruit. Thanks. You guys realize that there was a sin at the same time? Eve had a sin of commission. She did what she was not supposed to do. What was Adam supposed to do? God charged man to take care of everything he created. God created woman. That charge was a perfect charge to man. He was to, he was to take care of Eve, who was his helper. So by not doing anything, Adam brought destruction upon God's purpose for him. Adam sinned at the same moment that Eve sinned, because he did not do what he was supposed to do. And we try every way we can to justify this. Oh, but you don't know who they are, Pastor Tim. You don't know them. You don't know what they did. What about this one? Why would I help that person? What about this one? It's not my problem. This is kind of funny, but we just got back from camp. And uh, I, I, to the, it's almost to the point where I want to make our leaders shirts next year that say this. It's not my kid. Because there's so many, Ron can attest to this. There's so many youth groups out there and you're like, there's a, there's a group of kids trying to build a human tower to the top of that bridge. I'm just going to go this way. Not my kid, right? Not my problem. If it's not your problem, and, and eventually it will be. What's the solution? Stop seeing people how we are conditioned to see them and see how God sees them. It doesn't matter what your opinion of that person is. You're not God. You didn't create them. You're Jonah being scolded by God. It doesn't matter what your opinion is. And it probably won't go away. Because Satan's agenda is to steal, kill, manipulate, destroy, deceive. That's what his name means. So your feelings might not ever completely go away this side of heaven. But that doesn't matter. We are not called to see people the way we see people or the world would have us see people. We need to look through God's eyes at this world. I said this to one of our students. If you need to, there's these great things called affirmations that Caitlin told me about. She's a counselor. And affirmations are statements that are short, easy to remember that you say to yourself to remind yourself of things. But instead of saying them to yourself, say them about your enemies. Let me give you an example. Let me just use the word Greg. Greg is created in the image of God. God has a purpose for Greg. God sent his son to die on a cross so that Greg might be saved. And as you say that to yourself, what do you look at every day other than your phone? Your mirror. So put it on a sticky note, add it to your mirror so that way every day you say that, one or multiple, to yourself. 
Maybe it's Russia right now with all that they're doing. And you're hoping that Vladimir Putin gets what's, gets what's coming to him. God has a purpose for him. But I don't know about you, if I looked at Saul with all that he was doing to the early church, I would never guess that we would end up with Paul, who we are reading this morning. And it was because someone cared enough to listen to the words of God and go find him when he was blind after his encounter with Christ and spend time with him, years with him, telling him about Jesus before he ever entered into his ministry. We need to see people this way. There's a great quote from Charles Spurgeon. This is my all-time favorite quote. It says this, If sinners be damned, at least let them leap to hell over our dead bodies. And if they perish, let them perish with our arms wrapped around their knees, imploring them to stay. If hell must be filled, let it be filled in the teeth of our exertions, and let not one go unwarned or unprayed for. That is the mercy and kindness mentioned in Micah 6 8. And yet, instead of them leaping over our bodies like a kid holding on to their legs because you don't want them to leave, we're letting them walk by. And we think we're innocent when God calls us to snatch them from the fire. Three areas this happens often with our enemies. It's not my problem. I'm good. We say that like God's grading on a curve. I'm not as bad as that person. Like I know like I've got my stuff, but Ed, I'm going to let him do that so that way maybe we can get in line together at the end of time and I'll look real good. God doesn't grade on a curve. Romans 1, 28 through 32 says this, And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. Listen to this, this resume. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. <clears throat> they are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. That's not a good resume. Why should you get into heaven? Well, let me tell you. But check this out. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. Do you know what that word approval also translates to sometimes? Allow. We're just as bad by just sharing our opinions and let evil have its way in this world. Why are sinful communities a louder mouthpiece in the world than the church? Why don't we have parades for righteous living? Why aren't we outside this building? Why is stuff like Peru an anomaly? Why? Because I'm good. This also happens in our homes. Not investing in the spiritual lives in our household. Joshua 24, 15. Check this out. This is our call. And if you have kids that are older kids, this is still your call. And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your fathers served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Now you cannot save your kids. You cannot save anybody. The Bible says train them up in the way they should go. That doesn't mean they will. But that means that your call is to train them up in the way they should go. That does not end when they turn 18. We are constantly training. And I love this Shema in Deuteronomy. It says, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And then it starts talking about our children. It's not talking about your individual children. It talks about the children of the church. So let's take this even farther. All the children of Israel were called to be cared for by the nation of Israel, whether they were biological children or not. That is still our call. 
If you look at the children's ministry and you see a need, you can't retire from that. You can't move on from that. You can't let that just happen. If you have an opinion about the students and you just let things happen, as for me in my house, as for us in this church, the house of the Lord, we will serve the Lord. Not go to church. We will serve the Lord. Where? The church. Community. The ends of the earth. Why? So that every knee bows and every tongue confesses that the Lord is one and alive and active and coming back. That leads us to the third place we let this happen in the church. Watching things fail instead of helping. If this church is filled with Christ followers who love what Christ loves, there is no reason it should ever fail. If you're worried about this church closing its doors or any church closing its doors, it is time to rise up and serve. You know when you can stop? When you walk through the gates of heaven. We just got a new website. And there's a portion of it called Next Steps. Whether you're 5 or 85 you have a next step to take in your walk with Christ. You just need to pray about what that is. Luke 10, 2, And he said to them, The harvest is plentiful and the laborers are few. Therefore pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. The harvest is plentiful. Ask Miss Gail. My daughter, Kennedy, is no longer the only child that she has in there. And while Gail is a superhero... She needs help. That harvest is ripe for the picking. Some of these kids don't have parents. Some of these kids don't have grandparents. I remember growing up, I felt like I had multiple parents and multiple grandparents because of my church. You ever heard of the village mentality? We need help. And I had this thought while I was writing my notes. Why do we even have to pray for this? Why does Jesus say that we have to pray earnestly? It's because like the Good Samaritan parable, we have too many people walking by and not enough people that will stop and help. And unfortunately, that means we have to pray earnestly for it. That shouldn't be the case. That was never God's prescription. It's not how God intended it in Genesis. If God is perfect and there is imperfection, that was never his purpose. All of us are guilty of rejoicing with or welcoming unrighteousness in this world, but it doesn't have to be that way. This is not a time of condemnation. Jesus didn't come to condemn. Neither do we in this church. We are not here to condemn. But when you have the law and you see where we're supposed to be, the wise thing to do is to Turn around and start moving and not omitting what God has called you to do. So what's the solution? I love this. 1 Corinthians 13, 6, B. Rejoicing with, remember, welcoming, allowing, seeking, what? The truth. What's the solution? Truth. In your life and in the lives of this world. That's the solution. Look at the beginning of 1 Corinthians 13. It's not being a superhero. It is love and truth. That's the solution. Not necessarily only in this building. It's, it, it's amazing that the solution to evil in the world is truth. It's amazing what happens when you know what you're supposed to do. Just this week... Uh, Joel Barrett comes to the 1015 service. He and I went, tried to go fishing. And we just hopped in our car, try to turn on my, my GPS. And we were going to go to Silverwood Lake. And all of a sudden it has us turn down this extremely rocky dirt mountain trail. And we're winding everywhere. And it says it's going to take us an hour to get there. And we're like, what's going on? And eventually we get this close to the lake and then it has us turn way back in the mountains. And we're like, what's happening? And then finally we get to this, this guy on this tractor and he's digging out this road and so we can't go any further. 
And he comes to us and he says, sorry guys, the lake is actually closed today because it's being treated. The one day they close the lake is the day that we try to go fishing. So we had to turn around, drive to Hesperia Lakes, pay way too much money to try and go fishing. And all we caught were seven of these little baby carp that kept stealing our bait. It would have been so much easier if we knew the, tr the truth before that. We wouldn't have wasted that hour, the potential popping of a tire on a dirt road. It's amazing what the truth can do. What's God's definition of truth, though? John 17, verses 14 through 19. This is Jesus praying before he would be crucified. He says, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world. You're not of this world. Your citizenship is in heaven. Just as I am not of the world. We share that with Christ. That's what we have in common. I do not ask that you take them out of the world. Wouldn't that be nice? Just take us all now. Even Jesus didn't ask for that, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world just as I am not of the world. Here we go. Sanctify them, which means make them like Jesus. Make them holy like Jesus. Sanctify them in what? Your truth. What is your truth? Your word is truth. The solution is Jesus shining in us and through us. Not just in us. We're good at that part. We come to church. We read our Bible every day. I sing louder than the person sitting behind me. Through us. Letting the word of God soak into your head and then out through your hands. That's the solution. God's truth shining forth in this world. Not our opinions. Not letting it just happen until they get what they deserve. God's coming anyways. He'll teach them all a lesson. Not letting that happen. Not condoning righteousness by inaction. But by being aware and then being involved. Two steps. In other words, actually caring. Not saying that we care. Actually caring. But there's a way to do this. Colossians 4, 5, and 6. Walk in wisdom toward outsiders. Making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious. Seasoned with salt. So that you may know how you ought to answer each person. What's the wise way of sharing truth with this world? Number one, being gracious or being with grace. Receiving what they don't deserve. We are advocates for not giving people what they deserve, but showing them that a God is going to give them and can give them what they don't deserve. How else? Seasoned with salt. In this time period, not only did salt add flavor, which I'm pretty sure all of us are thankful for, but you got paid. If you've ever heard the phrase, is the person worth their salt? That's actually a Roman phrase because you would collect your payment in salt. It was how you added flavor to food. It was how you preserved food. So your words have value and flavor. They're not just some clanging symbol, as 1 Corinthians 13 says. And how do we do this? listening first it doesn't say so that way we know what to say it says so that we know how to answer each person you know what answering means we're listening first we are aware of what's happening in the world why so that we can be involved effectively in the world how with graciousness and intentionality that's one of our eyes i'm being intentional with my words they have value i'm not just opening my mouth I'm listening, and God is speaking through me. We need to do something about this. In our church, in our families, in our community, in the world. If you don't like darkness in this world, and if you're a follower of Christ, that is you. There's a way that we are called to do something about it. 
not like Jonah. But if we love the way God loves, we can't just let evil have its way in this world. Because by allowing it, we're rejoicing in it. And that's not loving. We need to love as Christ loves and engage them with gentleness, kindness, compassion, self-control. That's a hard one. With our anger, all those other fruits of the Spirit. That's what we are called to be as a church. Not listeners, but doers, as James calls us to. So let's be that, amen? Amen. amen? Let me pray for us. Father, I thank you for this morning. God, I thank you for the opportunity to look at a heavy, heavy truth. God, that there is evil in this world and you have called us to respond to that evil. Not to allow it to happen as we watch this world burn, but God, to snatch them from the fire in love. That when we look at this world with unrighteousness, even if we would call them an enemy to ourselves, help us to see those people as you see those people. And help us to respond even to the point of wrapping our arms around their legs, imploring them, warning them, teaching them in compassion and love as you love. Let us not be content with unrighteousness in this world, but let us be a force for righteousness in this world. We love you, Father. We lift this time to you. We ask that we wouldn't just be hearers, but God, that this this word that you have given us today would soak into our hearts, overflow through our hands and our feet. And it's in the great and powerful name of Jesus that your church prays. Amen. Thank you all so much for joining us this morning, whether online or in person. Have a wonderful day. Please plug into a small group if you haven't already uh, and have a wonderful day. You are all dismissed.